Well, this morning as we uh, kind of wrap up our, our series called Hostage, um, I, I saved this one uh, for last because my concern is for a lot of us that over the last few weeks as we've preached about, um, we've preached about bitterness, we've talked about worry, we talked about fear, and I think uh, I, I, <laughs> my fear um, for, for us is that uh, we find it an area in our life where God has spoken to us and he's clearly uh, given us some freedom or some direction in one of these areas. And from talking with you guys, I don't know why it's doing this. Uh, let's just give that up. There we go. We'll just do it this way, the old-fashioned way. It's kind of supposed to be funny, but um, again, funny here, not funny here. Um, but my fear is, is that we've experienced some freedom in some of these areas that we've talked about, and I know that this is common, I think, for all of us, is that we experience some freedom in that. We really feel like we've um, taken a step forward or, or two steps forward, and then something happens, and, you're, and maybe you blow it. And then the voice of the enemy begins to come in and to tell you lies about who you are. See, you're not really a Christian. I knew it wouldn't make any difference. Why do you even try? You ever hear some of those voices? And so this morning, um, I, I want to look at, at lies and a passage of scripture that I want to remind us about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting with verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up, up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to the world. And in that word, stronghold, um, uh, the, the word in the Greek there is called okurama, which means to fortify a strong castle. And a lot of times in our lives, we have these things that are um, strongholds in our life that we continually seem to struggle with. And so rather than focus on a number of different lies, which there's plenty of them that we could focus on, I want to look at one main lie this morning. And I want to see if, see if you can relate to it this morning. Because I think when we experience failure um, and things like that in our Christian lives, that there's one lie that we believe. And that lie is that God can't change me. Has anybody ever felt like that? And I think a lot of times in our lives, we can't seem to stop worrying. We can't seem to stop um, being afraid of things or worrying about the bills or worrying about the things that come out of your mouth, worried that I, I can't stop looking at porn. I can't, st every time I look at that person, I'm just filled with anger or bitterness. And you found yourselves at this place, and have you ever heard this come out of your mouth? Well, I just can't help it. It's just the way I am. And folks, that is a statement of defeat. When we say, I just can't help it, it's just the way I am, at the root of that is a lie that you've believed. Is that God can't change me. And we may, ne we may not say it that way. We wouldn't go, oh, no, no, I believe God can change me. But when we say, uh, I just can't help it, that's just the way I am. This is, that lie is at the root of that statement. Because the fact is, God can change you. I have told um, some of my story um, 
from this platform many different times. And a lot of you would know, but I'm just going to kind of highlight it here for just a second. From the time that I was 12 years old, well into my adulthood and ministry years, that I struggled with the sin of pornography. And it followed me all of those years. From the very first time, I'll never forget um, going to the bathroom at a friend's house, and on the back of the toilet was a stack of pornographic magazines. And from that moment on, there was something that followed me all, all the way through. I got into high school. The struggle followed me. I got to college. The struggle still followed me. I got married. The struggle still followed me. I became a pastor. The struggle still followed me. And I can't tell you how many times, over and over again, and I... I say this because I know it's been my experience and I'm sure that it's been many of yours. God, if you will only forgive me this time, I'll never do it again. If you'll just forgive me this time, I'll never do it again. Anybody ever said that? Anybody ever experienced that? Folks, I know that I'm speaking the truth and it doesn't matter if it's necessarily uh, pornography, doesn't matter if it's anger, it doesn't matter if it's fear, it doesn't matter if it's worry, it doesn't matter if it's bitterness. We've said that many, many times. And I want to expose the center of the lie here because I believe that if the enemy can get us to believe this lie, we're done. He has done all that he needs to do to defeat us. But scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That word, handiwork, translated is actually the word for masterpiece that we are God's masterpiece. And that word that is used there, again, sorry for the Greek twice today, but um, polema. Polema literally means des a des created for a design purpose, workmanship, or masterpiece. You are God's polema, handiwork. God created you in, a, created you in mind that he had specific things for you to accomplish, specific things that he has in store for you and for your life. And a lot of times we think, well, I, I just can't do that. Well, I just can't overcome that sin. Well, folks, who on earth do you believe in? And I know that these are the things that go on in our minds that we definitely wouldn't ever say verbally, but I know that we experience them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, and we talked about this during baptisms, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, or the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new one is here. Don't believe the lie, because when you become a new creation in Christ, the old is gone. It's over. You are a new creation. You have new found value, new found faith. And as I've been going through this message this week, or actually the last couple of weeks, um, there's an old song that keeps coming back to my mind. And old, I would say, I would consider it old, okay? Okay. Um, but it, there's, it's an old Wayne Watson song. Does anybody remember Wayne Watson and his music? I want to play that song for us this morning, and the words are on the screen because it talks about the value of someone who has been touched by the master's hand.
battered and scarred And the auctioneer felt It was hardly worth his while To waste much time on the old violin But he held it up with a smile Well, it sure ain't much But it's all we got left I guess we ought to sell it too Oh, now who'll start the bid on the soul violin? Just one more and we'll be through. And then he cried, one, give me one dollar, who'll make it two? Only two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars twice, now that's a good price. Now who's gonna bid for me? Raise up your hand now, don't wait any longer The auction's about to end Who's got for just one dollar more To bid on this old violin? La 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 Well, the air was hot and the people stood around as the sun was set low From the back of the crowd, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow He wiped the dust from the old violin, then he tightened up the string
the difference in our lives is the touch of the master's hand. You see, it's not, it's not anything that we do. And we begin to believe the lie that there's something that we can do. And when we try to do things in our own strength and we try to do things um, the way that we think that they should be done, and then things don't change, we begin to believe this, that God can't change us. But it says in that passage that we looked at earlier that God has given us weapons, weapons to stand on, weapons to fight in this battle. So what are those weapons? The first one is this, that we need to capture wrong thoughts. We need to capture wrong thoughts. That passage said that we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And I like how what we're ending on this week isn't something that holds us hostage, but it's the thoughts in our lives that we, through Christ, are going to hold hostage. Because it is no longer us who has to be held hostage. We have been set free. And the one who sets us free is the one who gives us the strength and the power, I firmly believe, to take every thought captive. We have to understand and realize that in the, mis in the midst of this, that we need to differentiate between fact and truth. You may say to yourself, my marriage is failing. There's no hope. Another fact, I've been, I haven't been the husband that God created me to be. I'm not leading spiritually. I'm not sacrificially serving. Those are the facts. However, the truth is, that God can make me into the husband that he created me to be. The truth is that God can forgive me. As a matter of fact, he's already forgiven me. You may have sinned, yes. But have you sought the Lord in forgiveness? And so the truth that we need to get through our thick little skulls is that this is not true because this is the truth. The fact is that he's already changed you. And yet we continually struggle and fight because somehow we think it's something that we've done. But the fact is, when you become a new creation, when, you have, when Christ has done that work in you, he's already changed you. He's already, you are already a victor. Everything that we need in Christ is already ours when we make that confession of faith. We firmly believe that. And it is then as we continue in the process of growth to become more and more and more like Christ when we understand that he's already made the changes in us. He's still working on our behavior, but the heart has been changed. When we make that confession of sanctification, when we ask for Christ to come in and to cleanse our sin nature and to set us apart for his purposes and his use, he's already done the change, folks. Does that mean that there's not times that we don't struggle? Absolutely not. I wouldn't say that. That'd be a lie. But the fact is he's already made the changes. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to take captive wrong thoughts. Now, a lot of times we don't take them captive because we, they come in and we let them kind of run around for a little bit. And when they run around for a little bit, they make a mess, don't they? We have to get in the habit of taking it captive. The second thing that we need to do is we need to speak truth. 
We need to speak truth. Now notice that I didn't say that we need to think about truth. I didn't say that we need to memorize truth. I said we need to speak truth. Now, we need to think about truth, absolutely, and memorizing truth is absolutely helpful, but I believe that we need to speak the truth. Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The tongue has the power of life and death. That's extreme language. The things that come out of my mouth have the power of life and death. And I think too often we speak our own defeat. When we say, well, I'll always blank. I'll always be this way. I can't overcome that. When we speak what the words come out of our mouth become, I believe, who we are in Christ. And giving power to a lie that leads to a lifestyle of bondage is not the truth. It, we speak it into existence. And so here I am going through one of the darkest seasons of my life, as I talked about earlier. I was a youth pastor. I'd been a follower of Christ for many years. I was a, fo- I was a father, a husband, and I was a prisoner. I was a prisoner to a completely secret life at the time and where I was absolutely enslaved by sin. I told my wife everything. I had to resign from my job. We went to counseling, and the healing began. That was over 13 years ago now. And finally, I was able to re-enter the ministry, but I still lived with this shame this fear of everybody finding out. And one of the stipulations of me coming back into ministry was that I needed to tell whoever my pastor was that I was going to be working for. And, and that was a beautiful story of redemption and of, uh, of renewal of faith for me as well. But I lived with this fear for almost two and a half years of what people would think of me if they, if they found out. And it wasn't until I, I went to interview um, at my home church in Medford. And I, I, of course, told the senior pastor, and he encouraged me to tell the church board. So I told the church board. And then out of that, one of those church board members said, tomorrow night you have an interview where you're going to go through a question and answer time with all of the parents and with all of the teens. He said, I think you need to tell your story. What's she talking about, Willis? I can tell you, at that point in my life, I was terrified. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want anybody to know that. I I, Honestly, I thought, what in the world are they going to think? I mean, who wants a pervert for a youth pastor? What was I believing? Because that's not who I was. And so that night came, and I'll tell you, I, literally, I was sick to my stomach. I was nauseous. Um, probably the most nervous I've ever been in my life. And I thought, okay, Lord, I'm going to be obedient to you because I do feel like this is it, but there's not a chance I'm getting this job. You know, I can understand a pastor understanding grace but not a whole group of people. And so I stood and I told my story. I I was trembling. I was so nervous. And at the end of that evening, 
something incredible happened. I had person after person after person come and tell me thank you for sharing my story. And I had a couple of people say, I want somebody to fast for my kid who understands God's grace, who's been there. And I honestly didn't think in a million years that that would be the case, but I spoke the truth. And I found that where truth is, darkness cannot be. When you shine the light of truth into any area of your life, darkness can't live there. And so, folks, that's why I can talk about it. I mean, you've heard me talk about it before. I'm not ashamed to talk about it now. The reason I'm not ashamed is because this isn't true. This is true. So don't believe the lie. We need to speak the truth. And literally, telling my story publicly, I had been forgiven, I had been restored to ministry, but the healing, I firmly believe, really started after I told my story publicly. And after I spoke truth. I believe that's when the real healing began to take place. So we're going to take every thought captive. We're going to speak the truth. And the third thing is, is that we will not quit. I think in our American culture, 90% of us who struggle with the same thing over and over again know exactly what we must do to be free. We know exactly what it is that we need to to be free. However, our pain tolerance is extremely low, and the pain of getting free makes us stop. And I'm not, I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about some made-up, self-help kind of. Thing to help us. I'm not talking about, you know, Stuart Smalley. Anybody remember that? I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me. Um, it, uh, it's not that kind of a thing. It's a true assurance that that Christ has done the work in me, and it does take work. I can tell you that, folks. The way to be free. It's not that you can just sit back and coast and everything's going to be fine. We have to do our part in this. And so Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ, all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Let me read that again. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works within me. He's the one who gives us the power to make our stand against sin. It is him who comes and makes that change. And we strenuously contend. That takes work. That that does. But the strength to continue in that comes from Christ. Because, why? Because he's already changed you. That's the truth. And so today... because of the truth of God's word. And I know that this isn't necessarily the truth for every single person in the struggles that you go through. But today, I have a wife who stuck with me. And to this, today, our marriage is stronger than it ever has been before. And I'll tell you, at the time, I didn't think that would be the case. And at this time, I can tell this story in public, and my kids are right here in the room. I'm not, I'm not ashamed. And I've got three kids. 
that love their dad. Matter of fact, some of them, they actually listen to my advice. Actually, they do. And I don't want to sound too churchy, but the truth of who God is and who he says you are, if you let that penetrate your mind and come out of your mouth over and over and over again, day after day, it will set you free and you'll be changed. And I'm just, I'm just holding up my life as example because, honestly, it's the only one I know. And I'm not holding it up as going, well, you know, whoopee, good for you. Don't believe the lie. It's a lie. Because he's already changed you. Do you believe that? The way I wanted to close this time this morning is with communion. Because it is because of what we celebrate in communion. It's because of that sacrifice that we've been changed. That is why we're able to stand in the face of sin and say no. That is why we can say in the midst of temptation, in the midst of times when we have blown it, not to listen to the voice of the enemy that tells you that you're no good, that tells you that you're a loser, that tells you that you, see, I knew you'd blow it. You're not a good Christian. You're not even a real Christian. Come on, we've all heard those lies. If we could get this one truth into our lives and really believe it, don't you think that would change our lives? Don't you change, think actually that might have the potential to change the world? And so I'm going to ask the ushers if they would to come at this time. And folks, I don't know, um, you know, I know we do communion here along the altar, but I wonder if this morning, if there might be some who would want to come to the altar and receive communion as a way of saying, I am not going to believe the lie one more day because I'm going to receive these elements and they represent the work of Christ that has already been done in my life. Because the truth is, he's already changed you. If, you've accept, if you have accepted him as Lord and Savior, and if you're striving with all of your heart to be like him, he's already changed you. That's the truth. So ushers, would you go ahead and come at this time? And I'd just like to pray for just a minute. And, and guys, go ahead and come. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, you have already changed us. I pray, Father, that we would believe the fact that when you say that you come and you dwell inside of a person, and you come and dwell inside their soul, that the old has gone, the new has come. Father, I pray that you'd help us to believe that the new has come and it didn't leave. It's helping us become more and more like yourself. Lord, I pray now as we receive the elements that you would quiet our hearts that we might receive from you. In Christ's name.